So I just attended the supposedly uh, greatest outdoor show on earth. This is the Calgary Stampede, which has been going on for over 100 years in this city. It's essentially, if you're from America, like a state fair. It's a place where there's a midway with like carnival rides, carnival games, really fatty food. Uh, you know, different attractions are going to be there. Bands, food from around the world. It's really something that the entire city goes nuts for over this 10 day span in July. Now, interestingly enough, uh, as, as I guess I wouldn't say I, I am a original Calgarian by any stretch of the imagination, but as any real Calgarian will tell you, after a certain while, we don't really go to the Stampede anymore, or very, very few of us actually do. But this is a huge money maker for the city where there's millions of dollars being made of people flying in and spending a bunch of money on these attractions. Now, so I'm a little bit pessimistic, I will, I will say there. I think it's fun to be had. I go mostly for the food and uh, my poutine was very well received by myself. They tried to do a Dole Whip like they do in Disneyland and it was, it was fairly decent, although I would say the Dole Whip in Disneyland is better. But as far as value goes, I was talking to Jen about this, where, yes, when you go to Disneyland or like Universal Studios, that sort of thing, you're paying like a hundred bucks for that ticket, right? You're going in, you're paying a lot of money, but then you can go to the rides and go to the attractions. All of that stuff is complimentary and you're gonna be paying for food and other uh, merchandise if you want. But in here, it just feels like you're, you're being asked to pay for every little thing. Yes, your food, but you have to pay for the, uh, rides, you have to pay for the games, you have to pay for this, you have to pay for that. And while it's only $18 to get into the park, it just feels like you're being fleeced everything that you want to try and do. They're still fun to be had. We got to see some great uh, photography and artwork that's on display. Uh, we got to hang out with some friends from YYCTube, our YouTube Calgary people. So overall, it was fine. It was good. I understand the importance of having it here in our city. It is a huge economic driver. But this is something that I think you absolutely must experience. Unless you are someone who loves rodeo and are gonna spend the money on going seeing like the chuck wagons and the, and the horses and all that sort of thing, then honestly, I would say that there's money better spent elsewhere. Like you mean it. Once again, Netflix continues producing these really interesting, intriguing, seasons of television. Castlevania is their newest. This is based on the old Nintendo game series. At least, I don't think it was any other type of media, but let me know if I'm wrong down in the comments below. It's always been about the kind of occult, these family or this family hunting vampires and eradicating them from the land. And this is no different. I am old enough to remember these Nintendo games, but this is following a character named Trevor Belmont on his quest to basically kill Dracula. Although what's interesting about this show is that it starts off by showing us Dracula's side of the story where he, his wife is killed by villagers and he's out to avenge her death. This is very much an R-rated cartoon, meaning that it has violence, it has swearing, this is not meant for kids in any stretch of the imagination. But I think that it's much too limited in its first season. I don't know the backstory, maybe I should have researched that before I pushed record. But this is four episodes long and each episode is about 25 minutes. So you could power through this in a night easily. It's about the length of a full length motion picture. But it's, it ends just as the story gets going. I mean, we're introduced to the characters in the first couple episodes, we understand the stakes in the next couple episodes, and then we're just done. We're done with this season. It, it feels like this is, like these first four episodes were a pilot that could have been made into one episode, almost. I'm still enjoying it, I still like it, but do I love it? I, I wouldn't say so yet. I, I definitely wouldn't give it that high marks. I want to see what where it goes. I want to see what happens. And I'm not given enough episodes to really tell you if this is a good story or a bad story. So I'm going to wait until the second season. It's already been renewed for another eight episodes. So I'm hoping that it can expand this world and expand the stakes and expand the, uh, the characters. Because right now, it's like 
I, I think I like this, but I have no idea. It's such a short little bite-sized morsel of entertainment. Let me know what you think about Castlevania. I'd be remiss this week if I didn't discuss War for the Planet of the Apes. For those of you who might be new and, and don't know, I am a ridiculous fan of Planet of the Apes. I love the fiction, I love the idea of it, I really enjoy the ideas and the philosophical themes that kind of percolate up through this entire series. I grew up watching the old original 1968 Planet of the Apes movie. I was not alive in 1968, so leave your comments somewhere else. Uh, and, the, and the sequels are fairly hit or miss, although mostly miss. Though the ideas are still interesting, and I think there's still cool stuff that you can talk about. Uh, interesting things you can talk about. When it was rebooted back in, I think it was like 2008-2009 when Dawn came out. I think I got that right. I think it's Dawn, then Rise, then War. This movie series, I'm telling you, is like the worst for names because I have n can never remember how they actually fall into place. Regardless, uh, I'm not going to go into a full depth reenactment of what my thoughts are here. There's so many things I could say other than I really, really liked it. Like, really loved it. There are... The, the performance capture in and of itself is jaw-droppingly amazing. I think Andy Serkis gives a great performance as Caesar the Ape. But I think that this is bringing in ideas of, uh, you know, where, where is man's place in this world? How did you find personhood? How do you uh, deal with revenge? There, there's just a lot of different things that I think we could talk about. But I would go and watch something that I filmed with my friend Daniel. We do a podcast together called Assumptions. And we go into much more detail in like an 8-minute video over on our YouTube channel. Uh, although, and I'm thinking we'll probably do a bonus podcast here when he gets back from his vacation so he can delve into more of kind of the apes fiction in and of itself. I'm fascinated by it. I really like it. However, I would be uh, not doing service to my viewership if I didn't at least talk about a bit of a, um, a backlash that's happening with this movie. And in part of it, completely justified. So let me tell you about the backlash first. This is something that came up with the last movie as well. In the last movie, there is, I, I, oh man, I don't even think that there is uh, hardly any female characters. Oh, there's one. There's like a female doctor from the human side. And I think maybe one line of dialogue from a female ape. And in this movie, it's kind of a similar thing in that a lot of critics are saying it's weird as, as forward-thinking, as, as uh, meaty as this proposition is that this movie gives us. It's odd that there is no lines of dialogue from a woman in this entire movie. Now, I will push back a tiny little bit on this in that there are a few different ape characters who are signing during the movie who are females and I think that signing does count as dialogue and there is very much a main character who is a mute but is a woman but absolutely this is a very male centric look at this universe and I definitely think it's a valid criticism but it, it gets me into this weird spot because as much as I do consider myself a feminist, I believe in equal rights, I think that there should be more female directors, I think that it took us this long to this summer to get a female-centric superhero movie is pretty ridiculous. I think that the backlash over the new Doctor Who being a woman is dumb. In this movie, though, I guess I just never noticed it, and obviously I'm a guy, so of course I'm, I'm coming in with a, a certain outlook and view on this. But I felt that they, they paid their... there was justice made to their female characters. I didn't think that this was just like, you could put a potted plant in the place of this female character and nobody would know the difference. I think that there is more value that the female characters play in this universe, at least in this third film. I don't necessarily think the first two films of this rebooted series I could say the same thing with. But in this movie specifically, I do think that the female characters that are given screen time are much more important than what the critics are giving them credit for. That's my opinion. Let me know what you think down below. Uh, I will say this. This is doing fairly well at the box office. If 
if there is enough interest to do a fourth Apes movie, I would love it if we did focus on more women characters, which is something that the this uh, canon, this this movie series, even from 1968 and forward, really hasn't done. Uh, my other pet thing, I would love it if it did focus a lot on the religion of the apes, because I think that's a fascinating topic, like how would apes consider religion and their place within it? Uh, of course, trying to convince a movie studio to give you money to fund a two-hour film that's about religion and apes, I'm sure is not the uh, easiest check to get written. Anyways, really like the movie. I've talked way too long about it when I said I wasn't going to talk about it for very long. I'll see you next week. <laughs>